Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath and for the opportunity of uh, looking into your word in order to deeply enrich our spiritual experience. May the Holy Spirit guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 24, long chapter. It has 67 verses. I believe you know the story, and we will go through it, highlighting some of the things that the text, the story, the narrative highlights. Okay? For you to understand where we are at, this is that big structure of Abraham's story. And although it seems that the focus is not on Abraham in this chapter 24, this is still part of Abraham's story, even though the camera is on Isaac, or seems to be on Isaac. So, in this big chiasm that centers in the expression, God remembered, God remembered Abraham, we have these two parallel elements. One is when Abraham comes out of Haran, Haran being the place where Terah, Nahor, and Haran, the brother of Abraham and Nahor, used to live. Because first they came from Mesopotamia, from uh, east, they moved to Haran, and from Haran they came down. So this is the trajectory, roughly. Okay? And from here, down. So Abraham lives somewhere here at this point, but he sends his servant back to Haran, where his brother Nahor lives. So that's where we have this other component, back to Haran. Out of Haran, back to Haran, or Haran. This is a very exciting story because it's love in the air. Love in the air in a specific way. If you look at your worksheet, you have the narrative of chapters 23 and 24 together. It is pretty obvious in the Hebrew text that those two narratives, chapter 23, which deals mostly with the funeral arrangements of uh, Sarah, and starting from chapter 23, first verse, we have a chiastic structure, and you have that A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and then you have Genesis 24, 26 to 27. That is the focal point of that chiasm. And this is what it says. Then the man, this is not Abraham, this is Eliezer, the man Abraham sent to Haran, right? So from here, Abraham sends Eliezer back to Haran to get a wife for his son Isaac. And uh, he says, then the man, then the man bowed low and worshipped Yahweh. He said, blessed be Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. As for me, Yahweh has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. So this is the focal point. The servant of Abraham, the one that was sent from Canaan back to Haran to get a wife for Isaac, he has a revelation of God's mercy and truth there, and he expresses this, and uh, he repeatedly refers to God as Yahweh. I put a different translation than the NKJ there, so you can see where the words Yahweh are used. And then on the second uh, side of the chiasm, 
you have uh, H, G, F, E, D, B, C, B, A, going backwards, and as you can see, at the beginning of the chiasm, you have the death of Sarah mentioned, and then at the end of the chiasm, you have the death of Sarah mentioned. That is the point that indicates, hey, you may be dealing here with a structure. Something is being told here. In other words, the focal point of this story told in chapters 23 and 24 is God's way of leading the life of Abraham, the life of Eliezer, and of course, through them, the life of Isaac. Because the whole thing about uh, Abraham sending uh, Eliezer back to Haran is Isaac. Just like Abraham needed a companion or partner in this God-given covenant, Isaac needs a partner. And Abraham wants to make sure he gets the right partner. So then you have on your worksheet Abraham sending his servant Eliezer with a mission. And there's a little structure there which focuses on verse 7. And this is what it says, the Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, to your descendants I give this land, he will send his angel before you. In other words, when Abraham sends out Eliezer, he emphasizes in front of his servant, you are not going alone. The Lord will send his angel in front of you. The Lord is preparing the way. I think this is remarkable because quite often the way we look at how God interacts with people, this is how we think about it. We think there is this life, this natural life, and then there is supernatural experiences. And we see those two elements as two distinct realities. This is normal, natural reality. And then there is a supernatural reality in which there are angels, there's God, there's this and that. Biblically, that is not true. That is a false dichotomy. Because biblically, in your natural life, the divine has a say and intervenes in action. When Abraham first comes to Eliezer and tells him, hey, I need you to go back to Haran, get a wife for my son from there, from my family, he says, okay, what if, what if the young lady doesn't want to come? And he emphasizes, again, don't take my son there. Because it seems that Abraham wants Isaac to stay here. Why? Because God promised the land to him. Isaac is the heir of the promise. So the place where Abraham and Isaac live is this. He moves back and forth. He goes down to Gerar, even down to Egypt sometimes because of famine. But then he comes back because this is the land that God promised to him. And God is going to give that land to Isaac. So he says, go there, get a wife for him from my family, from my house, not from this area here. Go back there. Because it seems that at this point, his family was already somehow a God worshiper family. They had come out from here, moved there. But in Abraham's family, God was known to some degree already. Whereas down here, the knowledge of God, at least the way Abraham's family knew God, wasn't present. So he wants a partner for Isaac, 
so to speak, from the same kind of faith. Even though, obviously, Nahor's and his family's spiritual experience is not at the level of Abraham's spiritual experience, because Abraham had been on quite a journey up to this point. But when Eliezer says, what if the young lady doesn't want to come? He emphasizes again, make sure you're not taking my son there. The place of my son is down here. So the focal point of that little chiasm is the Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, to your descendants I give this land, this land, he will send his angel before you. So that's a, an assurance that God is in charge indeed in this whole story. Then the servant goes, and at the well, he meets Rebekah. When he prays, because before he prays, the servant prays, and he gives God some uh, very specific features of that young lady. It means that Eliezer, whom Abraham wanted to make into the heir of his house, you remember? At one point in chapter 15, Abraham even argues with God over Eliezer. He says, no, Eliezer, he's the servant born in my house. Here in chapter 24, it's said that he's the oldest servant, so he's got the seniority among the servants. But he's a godly man as well. So Abraham gives this assignment to a godly man. Before he has this encounter with Rebekah at the well, he prays and tells God, hey, listen, this and this and this. Pretty crazy, isn't it? But remember, the story tells us God will send his angel. And uh, he can't even finish the prayer. The young lady shows up. At this point, watch this, Eliezer doesn't know who she is. Let me ask you something. Does Rebecca's family know Eliezer? Remember, Eliezer is Abraham's servant. At one point, Abraham leaves this place here and goes south. If Eliezer is the oldest of his servants, Abraham gets here when he's 75. That's when he gets down here. 75 plus 25, 100. That's when Isaac is born. Okay, so you have 25. Do you know how old is Isaac at this point? You will find in chapter 25... I think verse 20, yes. Isaac was 40 years old, okay? So you have 25 from 75 to 100, okay? Plus 40. So that's the time that passed between Abraham moving from here down here and now when he sends his servant back. So 25 and 40, that's 60 five years. So quite possibly, Eliezer, even if he was already part of Abraham's household when he left, throughout those 65 years, he never had an encounter with Abraham's family, even if they had known him before. But at the well, when he first sees Rebecca, he doesn't know who Rebecca is. Rebecca was a teenager at that time. We don't know exactly how old, but she was pretty young. Okay, let's move on with the story. It says in verse 16, and that's a little chiasm as well, 
Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold a virgin. No man had known her. So there's a focal point there where the fitness of Rebecca for Isaac is being emphasized. And then the servant gives thanks to God because God really sent his angel in front of him and he found the right fit for Isaac, the match, the right match. So there you have uh, Genesis 24, 26, and 27. I read that before. Now the servant is invited to the house of uh, Rebecca, who's Rebecca's father? Who? Bethuel. Bethuel being who? Nahor's son. So Rebecca also has a brother. Who's the brother? Laban. Laban. Okay. But it seems that he's the big brother and he knows business. He knows how to do things around the house. So Eliezer is taken to their house and he says, hey, I'm not going to eat anything until I let you know why I came. And he tells the family, this is why I came. So why did he come? To find a partner, to find the right match for Isaac, partner in God's covenant. But he already knows who the match is. He spoke with God. God brought out the maiden. She was beautiful, a virgin, the right match for Isaac. So how am I going to convey this whole story to her family and convince her that she is the God-chosen person for Isaac? And if you read the whole story, the servant explains his mission, emphasizing... Abraham's God and the relationship between God and Abraham. Why this focus? Because they know who Abraham is. They are Abraham's family. They are from Nahor's family. Bethuel, Laban, they are all Nahor's family. Somebody may think, okay, so how, how can these people be that crazy um, caravan of camels come and a man tells you a story and um, tries to convince you that you should give your daughter into marriage to that guy somewhere and you say, okay, take her. No, that is, it's not that crazy. No. They know who Abraham is. Abraham is their family. So Isaac and uh, Rebekah are what? Well, some sort of cousin. If Bethuel is Nahor's son and Isaac is Abraham's son, so they are, Bethuel and Isaac are cousins. But remember, Isaac is a late son. To Abraham, a very late son. So his age group is rather the second cousin on this side. Right? But he tells the story, and there's a very interesting structure in uh, verse 38 to 40. And I said to my master, perhaps the women will not follow me. But he said to me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way. Remember, the same thing has been emphasized before. So now the servant tells the story in a way that the focal point is the angel of the Lord will be sent. And yes, indeed, it was sent. So now I'm here on a mission 
and God was with me. And then the servant recounts the whole story how he met Rebecca at the well. And uh, in that little story, you have again a focal point in verse 44. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Again, the Lord appointed her. So throughout the story, this element of God doing it. Yes, I'm on the journey, I'm on the mission, but it's God doing it. God sends the angel, God appoints Rebecca. And then you have a point C, Rebecca chooses to leave her family. Let's read a little bit from uh, this part, Genesis 24, 50 to 53. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go, and let her be your master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. Again, what's the emphasis? The Lord has spoken. And it came to pass, when Abraham's servant heard their words, that he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Then the servant brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold, and uh, clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. I have to say something here. Seventh-day Adventists usually emphasize how much the Lord was on it. And when they come to this verse, with regard to jewelry, they skip it. Let's be honest to the text. And let's recognize that it was part of the culture at that time to give dowry. Is that the word? Jewelry, precious things, clothes, right? You don't have to skip it like read, you read, you read, and then, oh, no, no, I don't see this. <laughs> no, it's there. It's in the text. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. And then I'm going to read from 57 on. So they said, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. And this is a very important element again. Because there are cultures, there are still cultures where Marriages are arranged by the parents. This is what it says. So they said, her family. Because the next morning, the next morning, the servant wants to take the young woman and just go. And he said, no, no, no. Let her live with us for maybe 10 more days at least. And then you will go. No, no, no. Let me, let me go to my master. And uh, they say, okay, we've spoken, we've had this dialogue, we agreed, now let's ask her, does she want to go? So this is a crucial element in the story, because sometimes people would emphasize how important it is for the parents' wisdom to be in it. And I agree, yes, in many cases, the wisdom of the parents or of an Eliezer can be crucial. So you will not mess up in your marriage. Or didn't Isaac and Rebecca mess up later on? We'll see later on. But what I'm emphasizing here, they asked the woman, the young woman, verse 58, then they called Rebecca and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, Uh-uh. What if she had said, Uh-uh, I ain't going? Would he have waited? 
or would he have gone home? Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And then I'm jumping to the, to the end of the story, 63 to the end of the chapter, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field. So now the caravan is coming back. This young man, 40 years old, is out in the fields meditating. I don't know exactly what is in his mind, but when you know uh, the servant of your father has been sent to bring you a wife, you kind of have something to meditate about, I guess. Right? And uh, Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening, and he lifted his eyes and looked and there the camels were coming. Then Rebecca lifted her eyes. See how the story is told? He lifted his eyes. She lifted her eyes. So somewhere the eyes do what? They meet. Isn't that a beautiful story? Watch out. There's an interesting element there. Then Rebecca lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel, for she had said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master, not Abraham, the son. So she took a veil and covered herself. What is that? She entered the bride mode, according to the local custom. A bride would be covered first. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. That was quick. Didn't go to the court, didn't go to the altar. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And this is important too, because uh, some young men get married and they can't love their wife because they are not comforted from uh, the loss of their mother whether she's alive or not. But see how, how natural the whole story evolves? And in all this natural involvement of the story, you have God involved, deeply involved, you have the angel of the Lord, you have Eliezer worshiping, God praying, and God answering. It is such a beautiful natural story. But wait, is there a deeper story here? Remember that this is happening after the moment when Isaac was sacrificed. Well, not really, but the sacrifice happened through a substitute, through the lamb, through the ram on the mountain. So we are now after the sacrifice. Didn't after the sacrifice Jesus say, I'm going to my Father and He will send the Holy Spirit to you? And isn't the role of the Holy Spirit to bring the bride home for the Son? Oh, Abraham is a type of uh, God the Father, obviously. Isaac is a type of Jesus Christ. The son. Rebecca, the virgin, there's a reason why virginity is emphasized here. Rebecca is a type for the bride of Jesus Christ, the spotless bride of Jesus Christ. Then who's Eliezer a type for? 
Is he a type of the Holy Spirit? And see how from a story, from a love story of the Old Testament, you had the entire story of the New Testament. Isn't the whole New Testament about that? Wow. Questions? Good question. Why didn't God just send Isaac? Or why didn't Abraham? That's take it on the human side, okay? Why didn't um, Abraham tell Isaac, hey, son, you're 40 now. You've been uh, living in my uh, house for quite some time now, you know, that father-son conversation. It's time for you to go, get a wife, and have a life. Wouldn't it have been easier? And question, would it have been a problem? Like, don't you have stories in the Bible where a young man married somebody like that? Jacob, uh, son of Isaac, when he went to Haran, same place, he got a wife. So, it wasn't against the custom of the time to go yourself open your eyes, take a picture, see who you like, then come back. So why didn't it happen like that? Because it's almost against our guts in the 21st century to do that blind date organized by your father through Eliezer. It's not blind because the angel of the Lord was in it. That's something that changes the whole picture. But the question is still valid. Why didn't it just happen like that? Well, if you take in account the typological story as to how God the Father sends the Holy Spirit after the sacrifice so that the Holy Spirit does the work and bring the spotless bride home, then you have a possible answer as to why the story, why the historical reality, the type is shaped divinely in a certain way so that it can exactly prefigure the fulfillment. Good question. Eliezer made an oath, a vow, to Abraham. Let me read it so uh, it will be pretty clear what happened. 24 verse 2. So Abraham said to the eldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had. So this is a pretty big guy in Abraham's house. Please put your hand under my tie, and I will make you swear by the Lord. So the question is, where is that place that he put his hand under? Under, well, the literal word there is loins. Okay? Yeah, that's where he put his hand. Is it disturbing? That was the way they did an oath in those days. Now, it doesn't say that Abraham was naked when he did that. It was a certain kind of ritual, okay? And the position of the hand was under that specific body part. Good question. Does this have to do with uh, the ancestors or the descendants of Abraham? The word has to do with it because you have Bible verses in which it is said that you were in Abraham's loins, for instance, right? So, in this oath or swearing ceremony, it's like, swear on my family. But what it says is, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So 
if it has a connection to it, it probably says that you are doing this oath, you are swearing that you will keep my genealogy clean. You will take somebody that believes and worships the same God. And that indeed has to do with the loins. Question is, the question is, if this Eliezer is indeed the same Eliezer that we met in chapter 15, remember in chapter 15, Abraham tells God, listen, you have not given me an offspring. I, I have nobody, really. So this guy, Eliezer, a servant born in my house, he's going to be the heir. Yes, he is the same. And it seems that, uh, because this is now 65 years later, that description, the first time Eliezer pops up is after Abraham comes from uh, Haran down to Canaan. And at that time, he doesn't have an offspring, so he has no heir. He wants Eliezer to be the offspring, the heir. So time passes. In the meanwhile, he has Ishmael, he has Isaac, but Eliezer is still around. I guess Eliezer may have even known about Abraham's plans at one point. You may think, how did he feel, this Eliezer, that at one point uh, his uh, master switched? But what is very interesting is that right here, in spite of the possible difficult experience that this Eliezer has gone through, he's still the well-respected respected servant in uh, Abraham's house. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had. So this is like a house master. This is not uh, just anybody. And we see that he's a believer, he's a praying guy, and uh, he takes what Abraham asks from him very seriously to the minute detail. So very faithful, very, very faithful servant. And so the question is, why did the family want them to stay for 10 more days? The easy answer is we don't know. It's very logical, however, to think that when somebody came to your house at night and uh, you were told the whole story and in the morning they want to leave and you have a daughter, you would want them to stay for 10 more days. At least, because that's what they say. At least 10 more days. Right? So, it's, it's something that you need, you know, from a social standpoint, from uh, the heart of a mother to get used to it that uh, your teenage girl will go. Because according to Jewish tradition, we don't have the exact uh, age of Rebecca in the Bible, but according to Jewish tradition, she was a teenager. 47. <laughs> then I asked her and said, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the nose ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. I'm glad you noticed that verse was there. You noticed it too. Now, again, this is part of the story. It was the custom of the place. The description, the whole description of the story is not a prescriptive thing. It's a descriptive thing. Let me explain what the difference is. In the Bible, you have passages, you have sections where the whole thing is prescriptively given. Meaning that this is how you ought to do it. This is what you should be doing. There are other descriptions 
narratives, stories in the Bible, where the whole thing is descriptive. You are not told exactly how you should do it. Meaning, you don't have to take it from this passage that when you want to get a wife for your son, you find an Eliezer first, you send him back home to wherever you are coming from, get a wife from there, and when that person first sees that Rebecca, he should put a ring in her nose. You don't have to go that way, because this is a descriptive reality here. Nevertheless, you cannot eliminate from the story the fact that jewelry was used. And you have to be honest enough with the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, that they used jewelry. Now, it's also true that in the New Testament, you have some verses where the emphasis is that beauty should be inward, not outward. Instead of putting things on you, you should be putting things inside. Well, not even you, because God is the one that develops the jewelry on the inside. But drawing the conclusion that wearing jewelry under any condition is a sin is not warranted by the text. But again, the gospel is about inward transformation that changes the outward look as well. I don't know if that helps. So again, the question is, uh, so I thought Seventh-day Adventists said they don't wear jewelry. These are all Seventh-day Adventists here. Some do, some don't. Because based on the Bible, some have taken those verses from 1 Peter chapter 3, for instance, where it's emphasized that the beauty should be inward. They took it as prescriptive in the sense that they should not wear any jewelry under any circumstance. Some others said, not quite. If we are to stay honest to the text, we have to say that, yes, the Inward beauty is emphasized. Nevertheless, it doesn't say that it is forbidden to use any kind of jewelry. So that's why you have this and that in Seventh-day Adventism. It's also a cultural thing. In some cultures, Seventh-day Adventist or not, there is a big thing about wearing jewelry. In some other cultures, it's not a very big reality. I think when we approach this topic, we always have to be biblical. If the Bible leaves it like this, you leave it like that. Don't push it, don't force it over the Bible. Leave it as it is. That's one of the reasons why I teach the Bible the way I teach it. I don't teach the Bible skipping verses. Hup. I like this, this fits. I like that, that fits. Mm, let's just skip this one. You can do that with God's Word. God's Word is the way it is. There are passages that are prescriptive, and there are passages that are descriptive. Don't take a descriptive passage as if it were prescriptive, and the other way around. Based on the Bible, I believe there is a time when it is almost prescribed that somebody should wear jewelry. You know when? When a girl is a bride. Look at all the bride descriptions in the Bible. You will find no bride described without jewelry. Now, do I recommend that everybody in this Seventh-day Adventist context will wear jewelry when they are a bride? I will not do that because there are cultural considerations that you want to keep in mind. Uh, there are people that think differently about it. But what I'm emphasizing is if the Bible leaves it like this, 
This is the fishtail, you know. Leave it like that. Okay. Is there any relationship between the Canaanites and Cain? Well, in their name, <laughs> there is a relationship, at least the way it sounds, right? But in order for us to understand who the Canaanites are, we don't have to go all the way back to Cain because we have a reset of history at the flood, right? At the flood, we have uh, Shem, Ham, or Ham, and Japheth, okay? And Canaan is the son of which one? Of Ham. So Canaan is a descendant of Noah, just like the whole rest of uh, human population. Son of Noah, Ham, so he is the father, and Noah is the grandfather of Canaan. Now the Canaanites is a group of people that lived in the territory where Abraham was installed by God, and God told him, this is going to belong to you and your descendants. Nevertheless, he never really owned the land. He even paid for the burial place of uh, Sarah. But later on, after the 400 years of uh, slavery of uh, the Jewish people, when they came out from uh, Egypt, they indeed inherited the land. So that's where Canaan is. That part on the coast between Haran and uh, all the way down to Egypt, roughly. It's a very good question. So on what criteria did Isaac choose his bride? Well, if I get the story well, he got to love what others chose for him. All he could do at one point when Eliezer brought Rebecca to him is to look at her. You know, first she covered herself, and that's significant as well. And then the veil was removed, of course. I don't know exactly how it happened with him, what his feelings were. Did he feel betrayed or... Did he feel like, hey, I should have made my own choice. Why did you do this to me? What the text says is that he loved her and he even got comforted. Now, I'm um, emphasizing something here. In the 21st century, we tend to reflect our way of thinking about reality and feeling about things back into history. And we tend to think that if we would feel bad, because let me admit it, if my father had done this to me, I would probably have felt horrible. But then there are many elements there. My relationship with my father, the whole cultural setting in which I am. But I can just think or imagine that in those days when this was the culture, they didn't uh, have uh, much of a fuss going on when this kind of things happened. Let me give you a 21st century example. In my home culture, Romania, where there is a mix of population, Romanians, Hungarians, Ukrainians, Germans, Slovakians, all kinds, and gypsies, from all those populations, the gypsies are the strongest in preserving their culture, their historic culture. I pastored gypsies. I pastored a church where close to half, maybe 40% of the church was gypsy. And I just admired the way they related to family and, and how they perpetuated some things. Some things were bad, outright wrong. But there were things that were good. And what I noticed there is that things that in my mind are such a stretch, and I think, no, that's an abuse on their children. The children should be able to 
pick their wives, in their minds, it was totally different. They would say, yeah, mom and dad, they have wisdom, they have gone through life. So it's good for them to look around and see which one is the family that we want to be related to for the future. So what can you say? Should you say this is wrong or the other is wrong? No. Am I encouraging you to take Abraham's model and uh, from now on uh, apply it, including the ring in the nose? Not really. It's a description, not a prescription. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the very honest, open, and uh, deep-going conversation we've had together. May your spirit continue the thought process. In Jesus' name, amen.